Um, so to introduce myself, for uh, uh, those of you that haven't met yet, uh, my name's Mark. I am part of the, of the family here, not, not like on staff team or anything, but uh, it is very nice to be invited to, to come and preach. It's a real treat. And we are going to be continuing this morning um, in our series that we're in for the next few months, which is looking at the Apostles' Creed. And this is a short summary statement of the foundational beliefs of the Christian faith. And before we go any further, um, I'd like to, for us to read it together so that we know what it says. Um, it should be appearing on the screen any moment. All right, there's the cover slide. So in the Church of England, it is custom that we stand together when we read the creeds together out loud. So I'm gonna invite you to stand again and let us uh, say the words of the creed. Let's say this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Do have a seat. The first two words of the creed, which then get repeated twice more, are I believe, or credo as it is in Latin, hence the word creed. And it's worth uh, reiterating what we mean when we say I believe in this context. I don't know if you remember how Tim Brown put it right at the start of this series. He gave us an equation to explain that what we're really talking about is belief multiplied by confidence, multiplied by action. Or another way I've heard it put is to say that the words I believe encompass our agreement, our affections, and our allegiance. There are these three categories that form it. So our agreements, which are the things that we stand by, the things that we declare are true. Don't overlook this part. Truth is a precious commodity um, nowadays. We need to boldly state what is true, especially in the church. But saying that something is true isn't the full meaning of belief, or to put it really bluntly, even the demons would agree that Jesus is the Son of God. We also need our affections. We need to allow our desires, our inner world, our heart to be shaped by those truths. Another way of thinking about this, imagine a, um, a sports coach um, giving his team a pep talk before a match, and if he tells them, I believe in you, if all that he means is, I agree that it's true that you exist, that wouldn't be much help. But what he's saying, what we know he's saying is, I'm on your side. I back you, I support you, I trust you, I believe in you. But then the third leg to this is our allegiance or our actions, because beliefs matter in the abstract, but what we truly believe will be demonstrated by what we do. I can say or claim whatever I like about what I believe, but if my actions don't align with it, do I really believe it? For example, I could broadcast to the whole world that I'm a vegan, say, but if I carried on eating meat, I don't have any rights to claim that I'm a true believer in the cause of veganism. 
So when we say that this creed is what we believe, we're saying more than just it's what I think is true. It's not just a, uh, a sort of grab bag of opinions that we happen to hold collectively. It becomes a foundational statement for our entire lives. That's really important as we're continuing to look at what it says because we need to question ourselves, is this what I believe in that sense of belief? Is it what I hold to? Do I just agree with these statements on a kind of intellectual level? Or do I allow them to become the entire paradigm for the way I see the world, an anchor in the storm, a bedrock for my life? Do they inform how I behave and feel and act? Do I believe it? So let's go on asking those questions to ourselves as we focus on one part of the creed today, which is going to be this part. I believe in Jesus Christ who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. So to reiterate, what I'm not asking is whether you believe it's true that a man called Jesus of Nazareth was put to death by Roman execution during the early part of the first century AD and then was buried in a tomb. And I'm not asking you whether you believe that's true because the truth of those as events is not something that's up for grabs. The overwhelming majority of every serious scholar across all the relevant disciplines, doesn't matter um, whether they're Christian or Jewish or atheist, they'll pretty much all agree that these things actually happened. They are historical facts if we could use that terminology. Instead, what I am asking is whether you believe in the meaning of these events. Because those people who shaped this creed, this statement of belief in the first few centuries of the church, they weren't just trying to record a, a news item about someone being sent to the executioner for treason. The creed was based on the teaching of the apostles and uh, they insisted that these events had real significance. In fact, they believed they were just about the most significant events in the entirety of human history. You see, soon after Jesus died on a cross, Christianity very, very quickly became a cross-shaped religion. The symbol of the cross continues to be synonymous with the Christian faith even now. You'll see people wear it on jewelry around their necks. Our churches are shaped like crosses, if you ignore the extension bit. They're facing east towards Jerusalem where the cross uh, was stationed. Well, I'm facing east, you're, you're not. I remember... Um, when I was at primary school, we went on like a little field trip to our local C of E church. It happened to be my dad's church, church where my dad was the vicar. I guess he wanted to emphasize this point to us. And so he got us all, uh, we must have been like eight years old, to go around the church building and count as many crosses as we could see. And there were, there were too many to count. There was, there was a cross on the altar there was crosses on the covers of all the pew Bibles, I think. There was crosses fashioned into the backs of all the seats. It was embroidered on the kneelers, and, and there was a cross on the pulpit. But what is mystifying is why anyone would choose a torture device, which is, let's face it, what the cross is, as the central icon representing their faith. From a brand marketing perspective, it seems an awful choice for your logo. This is what baffled the Roman world and the Greek world and the Jewish world. Couldn't get their heads around it. The idea that these Christians would revere someone who met a violent death as a criminal. And even more than that, who would devote their lives to, lives to him as, as their God. In their world, that was unthinkable. This is Jesus of Nazareth. He was that guy that got himself killed seems a far cry from Zeus or the Roman emperor. Um, in fact, I wanna show you some uh, Roman graffiti from 
the second century. This was discovered on the Palatine Hill. It's one of the seven hills of Rome, guessing ancient ancestor of Banksy, something like that. It shows a man with one arm raised before a cross on which the, the person being executed is depicted with the head of a donkey. And that inscription below it says, Alex worships his God. Fools for the cross. That's what people have always thought of us followers of Jesus. And are they right? Are we fools for staking everything on what happened back then? But if they're wrong, why are they wrong? What is it about the death of that man 2,000 years ago that matters so much? Why does it matter so much? Why should it even matter at all to me or to you? Now, I have uh, three things, uh, not the only things that could be said, but three aspects of the cross that I want to emphasize this morning to help us see the meaning of these events. And to get there, we're going to look at the scriptures. I'm actually going to, what I'm going to do is take us to a part of the Bible that was written many, many centuries before Jesus was born. It's from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was a preacher in Jerusalem, the uh, capital city, the religious epicenter in Israel. And he was the person God appointed for that time to bring God's word to God's people. And amongst all the things he said and wrote were a collection of poems about a figure who became known as the suffering servant. And in these poems, Isaiah is anticipating a time where God is gonna send a servant in order to rescue his people. But this servant will end up being horribly abused and rejected. Uh, the New Testament authors ended up um, identifying Jesus as the fulfillment of this prophetic anticipation. And a large part of why they thought that was because of the manner in which Jesus died. So Isaiah 53, I'm starting in the middle of verse two. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Thought one, the cross displays our shame and the faithfulness of God. So the creed says that we believe in a God who in Jesus suffered at the hands of those that he'd made. And this is what Isaiah saw when he spoke about the suffering servant. Servant was despised and rejected by us, by humans. It's despised by me and you. And he knew pain. He didn't, he didn't know about it, but he actually experienced it. He felt it. It's God came personally towards us to show us the perfect life and his perfect love. And we just threw it back in his face. Now, I've always thought it a little bit strange that Pontius Pilate gets singled out for mention in the creed. Pilate, if we recall, was the Roman governor of Judea, the area that included Jerusalem at the time of Jesus' death. He was one of the people who sat in judgment at Jesus' trial. And Pilate, we're told, knew that Jesus was innocent of any crime. He was even warned by his wife that he should do the right thing and not allow an innocent man to be convicted and killed. He just, he just washed his hands of the whole situation and lets Jesus go to his death. Not only that, but the brutality of the suffering that Jesus endured under Pilate's soldiers and under Pilate's orders is truly stomach churning. You'll know what I mean if you've ever watched The Passion of the Christ. They spat in his face, they mocked him, they dressed him up like a king and then pretended to kneel in honor before him. They flogged him, which means um, 
lashing him with whips in which they've um, sewn like pieces of bone and metal. So the impact of the whip on the skin would gouge out chunks of flesh. And finally, Jesus was executed in one of those barbaric ways that the human race has ever devised. Crucifixion was so grotesque, so dehumanizing that the Romans wouldn't let their own citizens be executed in, in that way. This is God coming to meet us and we treat him like he's a piece of dirt. Yet in all of this, Jesus isn't an unwilling victim. This was his purpose, his mission. He had confidence that his death somehow would be the way, would be the only way to accomplish God's good will for his world. As we'll see in a moment, it was his way of fixing the mess that we've made of things. So he willingly takes on his back the cross of our shame. He bears in his wounds the pain of our disgrace. And through all that abhorrence, he remains completely obedient. So why is Pilate mentioned in the creed? I think he's there as a, as a proxy for all of us. So when Jesus suffered under Pilate, he suffered at our hands too. The cross shows our shame because it reveals what the true face of humanity looks like, and it's ugly. But you and I, we were made for so much more, and yet we decide that we're happy to settle for so much less, so much less than uh, the glory and the favor that God bestowed upon us when he fashions us out of the dust of the ground and breathes his own life into us and cho chose us to be his, chose us to be the objects of his love, prime recipients of this abundant, joy-filled world that he made. And we chose to say to God, well, thanks, but no thanks, we know better, and we'll take it from here. We'll do things our way from now on. That joy, you can keep it, love, I don't care for it. Willingly coming under the gracious rule of the God who made us. Don't make me laugh. This is the essence of sin. It's not so much those individual things we do that we know that are wrong, those are just the symptoms. The real disease is sin, where we turn our backs on God. And we have to reckon with the full weight of this. I think possibly for some of us, our problem is that we haven't or we don't acknowledge the extent to which we participate in that rebellion and the offensiveness of our sin when we reject the goodness that God is offering to us. And we wanna let ourselves off the hook, of course we do. We wanna say, okay, yeah, I've made some mistakes along the way, but I'm okay, really. And uh, I'm not as bad as those people over there. But the cross says otherwise. And in fact, when, when we do that, when we kind of make excuses, what we're really saying is that we still don't want what it is that God is offering to us. We don't want him to truly turn our lives around. We want him just maybe to clean us up around the edges. But the cross isn't a self-improvement plan for the comfortable. It's a rescue mission for the desperate. And that's why any continued failure to acknowledge our skin, sin is so tragic, the scale of our sin is so tragic. It's like... It's like being lost in the desert and turning down fresh water because we're too stubborn to admit that we're thirsty. Let's uh, continue on in Isaiah. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. 
He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. So second point to make, the cross displays our sin and the forgiveness of God. I don't think you have to be around church for very long before you start to hear about Jesus' death, not just being because of our sin, but it's also for our sin. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians that Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures or in Galatians, that he gave himself for our sins. Peter writes that he himself bore our sins. And 1 John says that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Um, Isaiah uses two of the Hebrew words for the way that we mess things up, uh, pesha and avon. Uh, it says the servant was pierced for our pesha, which gets translated transgressions, and crushed for our avon, which is translated iniquities. He died for our sins. But what is this connection between his death and our sin? Theologians will call this uh, the atonement, which sounds technical, but that word just means um, to cover over. And that's an idiom that we can get a grasp of because we still use it now in English today. If you're at a restaurant and someone's feeling generous, they will offer to cover the bill. Or if you step in for a colleague at work, you might say that you cover their shift. Don't worry, I say, we say, I've got you covered. What we're talking about generally is taking a cost on behalf of someone else. So when we talk about the atoning work of the cross, what we're talking about is Jesus taking upon himself the cost of all our mistakes, our pressure, our avone on our behalf. So he atones for our sin, he covers over our sin. Now, pause here. Wait for a moment. Because this is the point where I think our minds start racing ahead and we try to construct a sort of mathematical formula or an algorithm or a form a sort of production line of how we think this works. We try to get inside the mind of God and, and chunk it up into pieces that we can understand, right? What's the process of this covering over of this atonement? And my fear is that we spend so much energy obsessing over the mechanisms of the atonement that we miss out on its majesty. So pause. Jesus' death covers our sins, all our wrongs, all the hurts that we've caused to others, all the secret things that we're ashamed of, all the ways that we've let people down and broken their trust, all the mistakes that we can't mend, all of it, the whole mix, all of what we think of ourselves at our, at our very worst, everything that we've done in the past, everything we will do in the future, Jesus' death is the covering for it all, wiped away and washed clean, and that's magnificent. So don't miss it, but I can tell some of you still thinking, how do the pieces fit together? How does his death do that for me? I just want to give two kind of broad themes that run through the Bible and then come together at the cross. They're helpful for me in, in the way that I think about this. Hopefully, they'll be helpful for you too. First one of these is that sin is deadly. Actions have consequences, and the consequence of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. Eden was spelled out to Adam. On the day that you eat of it, you will surely die, God says to him. That's as clear as you can be. And yet, Satan's lies become a little bit more enticing, a little bit more believable, even than the good instruction of our father. You'll not die the serpent said. But he was wrong. Actions have consequences and the wages of sin are death. 
it's, it's like this. God is the source of life, of true, real life. And we can either embrace it or reject it. But the consequences to us of rejecting it is that we end up embracing the opposite, death. There isn't any life except that which God offers to us. And so he allows the full consequences of our own free choices to play themselves out for better or worse. That's the deal, but that's not the end of the story because the second broad theme is that God provides a substitute. It'd be great to map this out across the whole of the Bible. I don't have time to do that, but as you turn the pages of the scriptures, you see over and over again that God provides a way for someone or something to stand in the gap on behalf of humans, in the gap between people and the consequences of the choices that we make. He allows a ram to be offered on Mount Moriah in place of Isaac. He allows a lamb's blood to stand in the way when the angel of death comes sweeping through Egypt. He allows a goat to be released into the wilderness on the Jewish Day of Atonement after a priest has laid his hands on it as a symbolic act representing that all the own, same word, all the iniquity of the people have been laid on it and then it's just released away from the camp symbolic of the sins being removed from among the people. Death is the only logical outcome for people who have rejected life. And yet God brings life out of death by accepting that a substitute can bear the consequences of our rejection of him and his life. And finally and supremely, the substitute is God himself. He's the final substitute, the one to whom ultimately all those other substitutes were pointing. In Jesus, God receives upon himself the results of all our of own, even though that will lead to his death. There's, there's a point in the Old Testament when Israel has committed a, a very great act of wickedness and idolatry and Moses, their leader, goes to meet with God and he fears that Israel as a nation is about to be destroyed for what they've done. And, and he says to God, please don't wipe us out. Wipe me out instead and let them go. And God says, I'm not gonna do that. He refuses Moses' offer because he wasn't gonna ask Moses to do something that he'd always purposed to do himself. And so we get to Jesus' act of atonement, his act of covering over our sin, which then becomes written upon the pages of history, written for all time, written in blood that was shed from a violent cross under a darkened sky, written in unmistakable ways so that we wouldn't forget that it was for us, it was in our place so that we could come alive. And there's a struggle, I think, for some of us to properly and fully receive that, to accept that. And we come to God holding what we think are unforgivable sins. We come with pain and regret over the times we know that we've wandered far off the path that God wants for us. And I think we, we believe that the wrongs that we've done, especially those, I think, when we've committed them during the course of our Christian life after becoming a believer. We think that they're beyond the scope of what Christ's sacrifice accomplish. But if we come to the Father, we also have to recognize that sat at his right hand is Jesus still bearing the scars in his side that should say to us that all of our sins are forgiven. So, last section from Isaiah 53. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, 
and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So final shortest point, the cross displays our slavery and the freedom of God. So Jesus really died. It wasn't a metaphor or a myth or a mirage. It was the real deal. And his death was not just a great sacrifice, it was also a great battle. We could even uh, view the whole story as a battle, one in which Jesus' kingdom is reinvading and reclaiming ground that darkness and evil has tried to steal away and take as its own battle over who gets to rule, who gets to have the final say, which kingdom will prevail in the end. And as his body was taken down from the cross and then laid in a tomb, it looked for all the world like this was a battle that Jesus had lost. You put up a good fight, but in the end, you're just another fallen hero. Maybe they'll make a statue of you one day. But that's not the real story. In Colossians, Paul writes that what happened at Christ's death was that all the powers that try to um, claim our lives, try to rule over our lives, they were put on display and held up for ridicule. All of the condemnation and the guilty verdicts and the death warrants issued against us, they've been left nailed to the cross, a complete reversal, because in dying and rising again, what Jesus has done is comprehensively dismantled and disarmed our enemy's one effective weapon. We no longer need to be under that domain and enslaved by sin. It's what the world was always waiting for. It's what Satan had been dreading. The evil one de defeated and the decisive blow struck. So beginning with that lie in the Garden of Eden, all these ways of deception and destruction and decay and death have been irreversibly overcome. But not all of us will experience this as the reality of our lives. Not all of us will feel like we are victorious or free. In fact, we can even sense that either evil or sin or death are constantly knocking at our door. And the reason for that is because at the cross, while evil was overcome, it hasn't yet been fully eliminated. So we can say and live into the truth that we have been liberated from the power of evil, evil but we're not yet completely liberated from its presence. So that tension is real. And that is why um, discipleship, the practices of being a follower of Jesus are so important for us uh, if we want to experience more of that freedom that was won on our behalf at the cross. If we don't want to be harangued by besetting sin or plagued by guilt of past mistakes. When we have a baptism service, we encourage the candidates to fight valiantly under the banner of Christ against sin, the world, and the devil. Because in many ways, we are engaged in a battle that's a lot like the one that Christ fought on the cross, except it's one in which we know that we're already on the winning side. We still need to arm ourselves with all the weapons at our disposal as laid out in Ephesians chapter six. And we do so knowing that although one day we will die, at that point his victory will completely become our victory. And we will be raised into a new life and in a renewed, regenerated earth, in renewed bodies that have been freed from all the consequences of, of evil and all the consequences of our bad choices into a kingdom where Christ is king. Can I ask the band to come back up now? Uh, so I'm going to ask the band to play a song just while we sit and um, think about what God has been speaking to us over the course of this morning. Um, 
And there are three questions which hopefully I'll be able to get on the screen. If the uh, slide will flip on. Yeah, that's, that's the one. Thank you, Duncan. Um, so three questions for our consideration um, while the band plays. An opportunity to reflect on what God has done for us at the cross and what the cross says about what is true in our lives, where we need to receive that more, where we need to understand more of what that means, where we need to accept it as, as um, our truth that we can live by. Um, so yeah, just on your own where you're seated, um, reflect on these questions, bring your prayers before God, and then uh, Tim will come and lead us as we close. So uh... 